Hello, and welcome to the seventh presentation in the Tree Search and Bundling by Wood Science Center virtual conference series. This conference series was initiated to contribute to the scientific discussion in a time where conferences have been canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The full program and previous presentations can, is found at the Tree Search webpage. Uh, uh, but my name is Josephine Illegord. And I'm here to present today's speaker, Thomas Rosian from KTH, who will present Alignment and Nanoscale Dynamics of Flowing Nanocellulose. Thomas is research at, at uh, Tree Search. And actually, what? Sorry for that. Sorry for that. We have some technical problems today. Um, so Tom, Thomas uh, is a researcher at Research and was previously a PhD student of Allenby Wood Science before he went uh, on a postdoc to Stonerbrook. Uh, you in the audience can interact and ask questions or comment via YouTube chat function. For that, you need to be logged in and have a YouTube channel. And the questions will be answered after the presentation that will last approximately 30 minutes. And with that, I hand over to Thomas. Okay, am I here? Yes. Thank you so much, Josephine. Uh, I will go on and share my screen here. Uh, there we go. I think it's up and running. Uh, so, Thank you everybody for joining in on this uh, seminar in the Tree Search and Vir BBSC virtual conference series. And of course, it's a first for everybody on holding online seminars and the same is true for me. So I hope this will go well anyway. And uh, so I'm really happy to be able to talk to you about one of my favorite topics today, which is the alignment and nanoscale dynamics of flowing nanocellulose. Um, so this seminar is going to be more or less uh, a summary of two fairly recent publications listed here, um, which um, yeah, that go, go through a little bit in, in uh, what the motivation behind it and the results from it. Uh, okay, so the main motivation that has been driving this is is what we find in nature. So. When we look in nature, we always find this very intricate nanostructure. So we have these cellulose nanofibrils being synthesized in the cell wall. We have these crystalline fibrils being assembled into fibril matrices and building up cell wall layers and, and, and building up this, this nanostructure to promote me mechanical integrity and water transport inside various types of biomass. And and this is regardless if you look in trees in the forest or some kind of bushes or, or uh, bamboo, there you will find the same sort of building blocks, but very different nanostructure uh, just, just to promote the survival. And uh, of, this has been tailored over millions and millions of years to promote survival of the species in the specific environments and climates. Uh, so this is, of course, very intriguing. And the question is, uh, then, can we do the same? Can we utilize these, the same building blocks as nature utilizes to build stuff that we can do it ourselves? We know nowadays how to extract these building blocks, the cellulose nanofibrils and the nanocrystals uh, in energy efficient manner. And comes the question if we can use these building blocks for bottom up assembly into ordered structures and uh, so spoiler alert yes we can so th this this has already been demonstrated by a lot of uh, researchers already in the field uh, we had uh, Daniel Söderberg talking about this in the first uh, seminar as well uh, on how to spin filaments with aligned cellulose nanofibrils uh, in this process illustrated here uh, so where, where you have cellulose nanofibrils being pushed through a channel where you then accelerate the flow by adding some sheath floats from the side here. 
and a second sheath flow with some kind of initiator to de uh, decrease the electrostatic repulsion so such that these fibrils aggregate and form a volume arrested state of, of entangled and aligned fibrils. And once you dry such a, the gel that is formed, you can create these very strong and stiff uh, filaments. Uh, but it's not only uh, filaments, it is not only CNF, uh, so cellulose nanofibrils. We also find uh, various uh, examples in literature uh, for you know, 2D materials where you have uh, films or barriers uh, where, where you can align these, uh, these particles. For example, here we can shear cost uh, aligned CNC films uh, for micromechanical systems. Uh, or it has also been demonstrated in 3D printing, so you can really 3D print with aligned nanostructures. And both of these examples is, are, uh, are examples of cases where you, you use shear forces, hydrodynamic shearing forces, to align the system uh, to, to get a non-random distribution uh, on the nanoscale. And, and the aim is always the same. So, by changing uh, the, the nanostructure, um, you can really change the material properties. So these can be optical properties, how the material interacts with light in terms of transparency or polarization, for example. Uh, or it can be just mechanical. You want to change the tensile properties somehow, uh, how it resists deformation. Uh, or if you want to use it as some kind of barrier, then of course the nanostructure will determine barrier properties. What kind of constituents can actually pass through this this network of, of particles? And um, so by changing the nanostructure, we can also change the properties. Uh, and and doing this, we, we can do this with hydrodynamic forces then during the process. And if we can understand exactly how that happens that goes about, how that works, we can possibly control uh, the properties of the final material just by changing process conditions or designing and optimizing the optimal process for the, the cert, uh, so controlling and tuning the process to obtain the properties we want. But okay, so we want to understand uh, hydrodynamic alignment, then we really need to go back and understand what really aligns particles in flows. Uh, so let's say that we have a flow of particles here, and uh, you have a flow between two confining walls, you, you push fluid, you will get some kind of parabolic velocity profile in this channel with highest velocity in the center, low and zero velocity at the wall. Uh, and looking at one particle here traveling on a streamline, uh, the sort of flow field that the particle experiences here can be described with just a linear shear flow. And regardless of flow, it's always this frame uh, around the particle that determines how it uh, orients uh, in the flow. So the flow field just around the particle can be described with just uh, a, a matrix containing the velocity gradient. So you have this sort of linear flow. Uh, where you have a velocity gradient tensor containing all the spatial derivatives of all the velocity components. And this describes the entire the, the, the flow field just around the particle. So if this has non-zero elements, so this means we have velocity gradients and the particle will then orient itself to adapt to this flow field around it. So there are various types of velocity gradients. Of course, the most, two most common ones that you will encounter uh, is shear and extensional flow. Uh, and in shear flow, so we take this back as an example, the flow focusing uh, spinning that we demonstrated earlier to produce filaments. In this particular process, you have incoming CNF here uh, in and in the channel flow, you have a confined flow with walls, which means you also have shear. Uh, because as soon as the flow is in contact with walls, you will always have shear, uh, high shear rates at the walls 
and no shear rate in the center. Uh, and once we do this flow focusing, we really accelerate the core flow, which means that we also call the, the particle will experience this stretching uh, of, of the environment, which means that it, and it, it therefore aligns in the stretch, stretching direction. Uh, so this is always true whenever the flow is accelerated. So any type of contracting channel, some kind of funnel or nozzle, uh, you will have a sort of acceleration of the flow. Uh, but in most cases, you always have the flow also in contact with walls. So you have some kind of combination of shear flow and extension of, or elongational flows sometimes called. So, and this, however, is it's very different types of mechanisms that align the particle. And it's always uh, beneficial to have extensional flow in particular. Um, and I will demonstrate this with, uh, with some movies. Let's say that we, we have a system of randomly oriented particles, as illustrated here in 3D. Uh, and let's say now that we will shear the system. And the first view, as I will show here, will show you how the system looks like if we look in the vorticity direction at the flow gradient plane. Uh, and the second view will be looking in the gradient direction in the flow vorticity plane. So let's say that we run this, we shear the system uh, of particles. We can see that if we look in the view uh, in the vorticity direction, the system looks quite aligned. You will see that the particles tend to have this rotational motion as well uh, as they move around. Um, but if you look in the other view, you will see that the sort of alignment you get in this viewing plane is not at all as impressive as in look, when looking in the vorticity direction. So you have this perception of alignment that is really dependent on viewing direction when you look in shear. At the same time, you also have this always this relative motion between the particles that is probably not so beneficial if you want to really create uh, an aligned network because you will always have this shear also tearing, tearing it apart. On, uh, in contrast, if you would take the same sort of uh, random dispersion of particles and you will uh, apply an extensional flow, you would just see that the particles will tend to align directly in, in the uh, stretching direction. So of course, if you would like to obtain a really high alignment of your particles, it's of course, that you would like to have extensional flow rather than shear. So these examples are uh, just analytical uh, examples of how particles will behave uh, when, without any Brownian motion. And of course, if we add Brownian motion to the system, uh, you would have the particles themselves being sensitive to the bombardment of uh, all surrounding molecules that will, will hit the particle from different directions. So if we have here, uh, from left to right, we have uh, decreasing uh, effects from Brownian motion. You can see how, how the particles, will, which is very Brownian, will just jitter around there and, and almost span all, all orientations will almost be equally probable. They will span the entire sphere. Uh, and making the system more non-Brownian, it will go back to having this analytical rotational motion uh, as described by, by Jeffrey in, in early 1900s. Um, so the way you can control the level of Brownian motion is, is by changing the so-called Peckle number. You will change either the Brownian time scale or the convective time scale. And so, and the convective time scale is just uh, that's the level of hydrodynamic forces, more or less, that you apply to the particle. So this is set by the, typically by the shear rate. Uh, so if you have, uh, and, and the Brownian time scale is set by the particle size. So if it's a big particle, it's less sensitive to Brownian motion. The temperature, because if you have more molecules uh, moving around with higher momentum, of course, it will affect the particle more if it's higher temperature. 
and viscosity. So if, if you have a higher viscosity, you will also have less Brownian motion. Uh, so let's say that the size, temperature, and viscosity is constant, then you will only manipulate this with shear rates. Uh, so the left side will be low shear rate, and the right-hand side here would be how the particle will behave in high shear rate. Okay, so this is uh, briefly how, how it would be for single particles. Of course, we want to like to look at a statistical distribution of, of oriented particles. And then we need to talk about the orientation distribution and uh, probability density of certain orientations of particles. And the orientation probability of elongated particles is, is described on a unit sphere. So you can see it as a heat map on a spherical surface. Uh, so this, this particular image shows you a highly aligned system in Z direction, where red means high probability of finding a particle, uh, and blue means low probability. So here we see that since it's red around the Z axis here, it means it's high probability that it's aligned in this direction. You have the, um, uh, the variable that is dependent here the probability the density is dependent on is the phi angle which is the spherical angle towards the z direction and uh, if you would draw this orientation distribution function uh, as a 1d curve the probability density will have this shape uh, for the same distribution as shown here and um, so the density always have this scaling with sine phi and the reason is that we describe phi is, is the polar coordinate and sort of this spherical grid that we are used to with longitudes and latitudes. Uh, and the reason it goes to zero here doesn't mean that it's zero probability uh, or it's zero probability in terms of phi, but it's mainly a scaling due to the, the surface elements here becoming infinitely small. Um, so this is the probability density how it looks like if we would describe it with a phi, the polar angle on the sphere. However, this is never the way we, we see orientation distributions or can measure orientation distributions. And the reason is what we see is always a projection of reality. Um, so let's say that we have a particle uh, in, in space here described by spherical coordinate uh, or spherical angles here, phi and theta. So phi is the same as we said before, polar angle in the, towards the z-axis, and theta is the angle in the plane perpendicular to the z-axis. But we always have some kind of viewing direction of our system. So in this way, we say that negative y here is our viewing direction, which means that we only see the system in the x-z plane here. And we can, of course, uh, derive some kind of angle in this plane, which be, will be a projected angle uh, in this plane, uh, which we can call chi. And this we can, of course, measure. And if we take an image like this, we can take its statistical distribution and arrive at probability density of the projected angle, chi. And this is, of course, something that, that will be done in imaging. And we can, the way to obtain three-dimensional orientation distribution will, of course, be by taking various viewing angles and doing some kind of stereographic or tomographic imaging. But this usually requires quite a delicate setup. And especially when it comes to uh, nanoparticles, it's not very easy to do imaging of anything in flow. Uh, but what we can do is small angle x-ray scattering. Uh, so new synchrotron light sources have enabled us to really look at orientation distributions in, in flowing situations using scattered X-ray light. So what you do is you can have a flow of nanoparticles, you shoot an X-ray beam through this, and, and the scattered light will have this asymmetry um, which reflects the alignment of the particles. So if you would average the intensity in a certain um, wave vector here that uh, corresponds to dimensions between the length and the width of the particle, and you normalize this, this will be an experimental representation 
of your uh, distribution of the projected angle psi chi because it's the same problem as with viewing and imaging you still have a, a defined viewing direction and you will see only the representation of the projected system okay so this is have, has been done quite a lot recently with the enabling of synchrotron light sources and uh, and what what usually is done as a next step uh, when looking at orientation is that you reduce this orientation distribution to a 1d parameter uh, and usually it's a parameter then that uh, is zero if the system is perfectly random oriented so you have this complete random distribution uh, and a parameter that is one if it's completely aligned in one direction uh, so this is usually how these things are quantified you want to find this kind of uh, degree of alignment between zero and 100%. So is it 65% aligned or something like this? But there are various ways of defining this. And uh, I will list some that, that has been found here. We have these so-called order parameters, which all rely on some kind of polynomial of the, the cosine the function. So either you can describe it here with, with psi phi, which is the distribution on the sphere, and then you can use the second Legendre polynomial like this uh, to describe uh, an order parameter. You will see the sine phi scaling here because it's described on a sphere. You need the sine phi scaling there uh, and normalize it like this. Uh, often, as I've been found in literature, you also can define an order parameter based on the projected orientation distribution, psi chi, and still scale it as if it was a representation on the sphere. Um, and this will also still give you a parameter that goes from zero to one, from isotropy to alignment. Um, however, if you really describe something in a, on a plane, an angle in a plane, it makes more sense to have a 2D type of normalization of the orientation distribution. So you can also define an order parameter like this with the same properties that uh, it goes from zero to one. Uh, there's also the orientation index sometimes is used uh, where you uh, look at the half maximum of the orientation distribution like this and you at the halfway point you define what is the width of your function and you can take pi minus the full width half maximum divided by pi and you will also arrive at the parameter that is zero when it's isotropic and one if it's perfectly aligned the key here though is that none of these parameters are comparable to each other uh, there of course uh, all of them have the properties they start and end at the same point uh, from zero to one but they are otherwise never comparable so you cannot compare an orientation the index of 0 0.8 with a, an order parameter of 0 0.5 because that's not comparing the same numbers you don't know which one is more aligned than the others uh, and this is where where uh, I, I sort of came in and, and, and got a little bit critical against this, this whole reducing to a 1D parameter. Um, because we have experiments uh, that can provide us really with, this is the real system. It, it shows us the reality of things. It's uh, how things are for sure. We can observe or obtain certain observable quantities. For example, a projected orientation distribution. Um, and then we have, on the other hand, we have theory and models and simulations that are really important to understanding what is going on in your system. And nowadays, these can become also very sophisticated. Of course, there you always need some kind of assumptions of reality. You need to have parameters of interactions of polydispersity that might be a little bit uh, questionable uh, compared to the real system. But on the other hand, we can obtain any quantity, regardless, more or less, <laughs> uh, regardless if they are experimentally observable or not. We can get the three-dimensional orientation distribution everywhere, even though it's not measurable in the experiment. But still, when we compare experiments with simulations, we should try to do it with as little reduction of dimensionality as possible. If we can obtain an orientation distribution in both simulations and experiments, it should also be 
compared that way. Um, so with this in mind, this is where the, the sort of starting point of the two works that I uh, took up in the beginning. And I want to show you some examples of how, how this thinking has been applied in these cases. And all of it relies on, on looking at this system of spinning filaments, um, either uh, looking upstream of the focusing in the shear flow uh, before the, the sheath flows comes in, and also afterwards, what happens to the system in this elongational flow part when flow is accelerated. So let's start fir first with the extensional flow. And uh, we can assume here that. Uh, it's a uniaxial extensional flow. Uh, of course, the, the compression in, in the direction of the sheath flow will be a little bit stronger than in the other direction naturally, but it's still seen as being a fairly valid assumption that we can see compression to be approximately same in all directions due to effective interfacial tension of the core. So we, we stretch it out. And if we have a uniaxial extensional flow, we also have cylindrical symmetry around Z, which means that the probability density of this azimuthal angle theta is just a constant. So every azimuthal angle is equally probable. Um, and then we do, do some tests. Let's say that we have an uniaxial extensional flow to align our system. We do a test first that we have a system that is completely isotropic initially. Uh, that we align with extensional flow without any Brownian motion. Um, and then from this aligned system, we can go back to isotropy again with only Brownian motion without any hydrodynamic forces. So this will look like this. If we look in, uh, down uh, here, we have, this is how the distribution will evolve on the sphere from blue to just a small red point at the Z axis. We have, the projected orientation distribution in the middle here. And then we have uh, the probability density on the sphere, on the, depending on spherical angle, phi here. So this might look like it's, yeah, it's the same process, right? You have the same process going to alignment as you have uh, going back. But the, the interesting thing here is that it doesn't go through the same set of orientation distributions. Uh, when aligning the system with extension of flow or releasing it back to isotropy through Brownian motion. So they are, it's a different set of orientation distributions that you will have. And this can, so these are of course two extreme cases, uh, but this can uh, lead to very deceiving results when you would look at it. Um, so let's say that we have, uh, two different order parameters to describe the system. Uh, this is typically maybe what we measure, an order parameter based on the projected angle, chi here. And this would be the or corresponding order parameter on the sphere based on, on phi. Uh, and what we see is even though we measure the same order parameter going when we align the system and when we go back, if we measure the same 0.2 here, the, these same order parameter could be two completely different orientation distributions. So both these orientation distributions correspond to the same order parameter, both the green and the red one, even though you might argue that, but it looks like the, the red one is, is more aligned than the green one. Yeah, but just because it's a different set of, or, or, uh, of orientation distributions, they are not uh, really comparable, these, these numbers. Um, so it can be deceiving in that way. We, and it will be even more deceiving if we look higher up here where we have a really big discrepancy. We might measure an order parameter of 0 0.6 and we might say that it's 60% aligned. But if you would look at the uh, order parameter on the sphere, it might say 90% aligned. Um, so you can really have an order parameter that it underestimates the true alignment in your system. Um, so a way you can uh, do this instead, if you want to really uh, compare, uh, you have a system like this and you would like to compare, you have cylindrical symmetry. Uh, 
the way we proposed in this work was that you have these experiments uh, where you can extract the projected orientation distribution psi chi. You can reconstruct. Uh, if you have axial symmetry, you can reconstruct the 3D orientation distribution and, and then compare with simulations and theory. But of course, an even probably a more suited way, all round way of doing this would be to obtain from simulations and theory the, the 3D orientation and then project this distribution on the plane and then compare the projected orientation distributions with each other. Because then you don't need to have any assumptions of axial symmetry involved in the whole thing for reconstructing a higher dimensional distribution. A projection, it, when doing a projection, you will always lose data and it's hard to recover again going back. So this is an example of, of if you have axial symmetry in your system that you can do. This is of course not true for the other case that I want to highlight here. Uh, which is uh, describing uh, the alignment in shear flow. Uh, so here, you, as we were saying, we have strong shear forces close to the walls. The type of deformation that we have is planar. So you will always have the deformation in one plane. Uh, and so if you would have a, a cube like this and you would shear it, it would have this parallelogram shape like this. And this is the type of flow you will encounter in any flow with, which has walls. So tubing or channels, it's all the same. You will always have shear there. Uh, but this is actually a very complicated flow. It might look very simple to just push something through a channel. Uh, and, and the reason is that, well, we only have alignment due to shear. And as I was wanted to emphasize earlier, this, there's absolutely no axis symmetry of the shear flow that we can utilize. We know that the alignment is dependent on the viewing direction. And to make matters worse, we also, if we look at the velocity profile in a square channel, uh, it looks like this with highest velocity in the center and low velocity at the walls. The black lines here indicate the shear directions and the black lines are scaled with the shear rate. So highest shear rate you find in the middle of the walls like this. But you see, if you would shoot a beam through the channel here and obtain the orientation distribution, this will represent the combination of uh, various shear rates and shear directions. And on top of the fact that we also know that the shear flow itself is the alignment is direction dependent. So this is a lot more trickier to, to understand the results. So, where we can use simulations to compare instead. Um, so we set up this, this case study where we studied dilute cellulose nanocrystal in this kind of flow. So the cellulose nanocrystals that we got has lengths of 150 to 300 nanometers, widths 10 to 30 nanometers, aspect ratios in the range 10 to 20. And uh, so at dilute conditions that we looked at, it's 0 0.4 weight percent. And we push this material in this square channel uh, with the side one millimeter at flow rates ranging from 10 to 200 milliliters an hour. Uh, and we do this experiment at the synchrotron. We shoot a focused X-ray beam and scan the beam at various positions in the channel and to, uh, to, to see then what kind of orientation distribution, projected orientation distribution do we get at ch certain channel heights. And so this is done in a setup like this. And uh, we also uh, include a flow focusing section here because we know the system aligns best with extensional flow. So we want to have a, some kind of aligned reference to just set the zero level here correctly. And uh, so that's why we also introduced the focusing section, but we're interested in the data upstream here. So how the, orientation distributions vary. We see that uh, the, uh, the scattering pattern is tilted here, uh, which reflects the fact that it's actually more probable for the particle to be tilted in a direction towards the channel center. And that's why you get the skewness of the orientation distribution, and which is typical for Brownian particles. Um, so we get orientation distributions like this, 
going from different channel heights. And we know that this is still a combination of, of various shear rates and shear directions. And we want to have something to compare with uh, once we have this experimental data. So we set up some very simple experimental model, uh, simulated model here. We start off with an uh, analytical velocity profile uh, described uh, in this work by Spiega and Morini, just uh, to, to get the velocity everywhere. We make some assumptions that we have negligible translational diffusion. It's a monodispersed system of perfectly rigid spheroids with no particle-particle interactions. Quite, quite strong assumptions here, but for a dilute system, it might be fairly close to reality. Um, and if we do these assumptions, we can just uh, use simulations of single ellipsoids in a shear flow. We set the temperature and kinematic viscosity, room temperature and water, and then just test four different sizes of spheroidal particles here, ranging from 100 to 500 nanometers, 10 nanometers wide. So we have aspect ratios from 10 to 50. And so the simulation procedure looks like this. We just discretize the cross-section into cells. And we calculate the velocity gradient in each of these cells and then simulate uh, a particle uh, in given that velocity gradient and given the other parameters that we plugged in. And we then can simulate many particles from various initial conditions to build up the actual orientation probability in three dimensions. We then average them over all cells in the viewing direction to have the average three-dimensional orientation distribution in, of all these cells. And then as a final step, we can project this orientation distribution on the plane perpendicular to the viewing direction. And that should give us a psi chi uh, or project orientation distribution that is directly comparable to our experimental results from SATS. So this is what we did. This is the comparison. Uh, so showing the orientation distributions in the wall region, intermediate region, and center region of the channel. Uh, black line is showing the CNC results here. And we have these various sized uh, particles with the same conditions, temperature, and uh, viscosity. And we can see how these vary uh, between 10 and 50 aspect ratio. And we know that these CNC are, have aspect ratios close 10 to 20. So the, it's quite good um, resemblance to, to what we actually find in the simulations and, and experiments here. So the top part is just at 100 milliliters an hour. And here we have 200 milliliters an hour down here. There are some discrepancies, which is, of course, not, not too concerning since we have a very simple model initially to, to test with. But still, it looks like the CNC behaves fairly close to these uh, just Brownian ellipsoids. Uh, and we can, of course, extract 1D parameters to characterize something uh, in these, uh, to, to have some comparable numbers as well over various flow rates. Uh, and we can extract the highest probable angle here and how that varies with flow rate. We see that it goes down, it go, the tilt angle becomes more and more uh, centered around the flow direction and the alignment increases with flow rate as hydrodynamic forces overcome Brownian motion. And we see here also that it corresponds fairly well to the expected aspect ratios. Uh, so we can use this as, at least to state that it looks like our system behaves very close to, to dilute spheroidal particles. Uh, and then we can see what is the discrepancy then when we go to experimental conditions that clearly violates all these assumptions. Uh, so increase in concentration of CNC, we know that they behave quite strangely. They start interacting with each other with electrostatics. And, and we can see how that influences then the aligning behavior, uh, which is quite interesting. We, we see once we go above a certain threshold here, we see that it aligns very well at low flow rates at higher concentration which is an indication then that uh, Brownian motion is not as important anymore. And of course, we know that these form these uh, nematic droplets at higher concentrations where they start behaving collectively instead of as single 
CNC, which of course makes them uh, react together to the shearing forces uh, and this way overcoming Brownian motion. Uh, so this is interesting, of course, the next step would be to, to improve the simulations to try to match this sort of behavior uh, in the flow uh, and with some kind of simple interaction model. Um, and this leads me to actually the final uh, conclusions and my take home messages from, from this line of work uh, that I want the audience here to, to at least think a bit about. Uh, so all these new in situ experimental techniques, for example, the scanning sacs, uh, scanning this X-ray beam and collecting these scattering patterns, this has opened up a fantastic opportunities just to uh, characterize getting really good uh, experimental data that can really aid in finding the structure property relationships in, in processes related to material production. Uh, and at the same time, we have increasing computational performance with supercomputers, uh, fantastic network here in Sweden. Uh, to op and this opens up very advanced numerical simulations to be performed. Um, but I also want to emphasize that as even a simple model can provide very important knowledge. So uh, I believe that, that the model here, which was a very simplified version of CNC still, I, gets us to understand that, okay, if the system behaves or not behaves as this ideal system might give us some information and insights on how to improve it. Uh, and the key point uh, is at least that we can and we should be much more quantitative when we compare experiments with simulations uh, and try to reduce uh, uh, or not reduce dimensionality before comparison as much as possible so that we know that we're comparing apples and apples. Um, so the way I usually go about when I think about uh, the, these uh, process characterization is that it would be good to do these always simultaneously. You have experiments and you have simulations where you have experiments really giving you the in-situ characterization and the simulations can, you can use to calculate certain observables in experiments. And then you check if they match, no, no, then you go and improve your models and simulations. And yes, well, then you can use the simulation to predict, optimize and tune and control the process. And this of course can be optimized also. You can think of perhaps uh, in the future, this can be implemented with some kind of machine learning or AI tools to, to just continuously improve the model to match the experimental condition. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody that's been on, on this <laughs> journey of, of going into orientation distributions, which include uh, these people among some of them, uh, and also the financial support that I've gotten on the way. And with that, I also like to thank the people that managed to tune in this Corona Day number, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, Thank you all. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions on the material here. So thank you, Thomas. Uh, so just a reminder that you can ask questions via the YouTube chat. And we have a question from SY uh, who asks, uh, can we experimentally measure length distribution of CNC? and reproduce the distribution of the orientation as superposition of simulated curves. Yes, uh, I, or I mean, as long as the length is described within the, the, the Sachs range, I would assume that lengths are of course in the, the range of hundreds, hundreds of nanometers. So you would still need uh, to place the detector very far away to, to sort of resolve the data in those angles corresponding to those length scales. But I definitely believe that we can really use this also, uh, already been starting in this direction to simulate scattering patterns in the same way. So you can use the simulated system and you can perform a simulated SACS experiment. Since SACS is really just a Fourier transform of the particle distribution, you could just Fourier transform your particles to obtain the detector image as such. And then you can really compare 
uh, not only the azimuthal data containing the orientation distribution, but also the radial data, which includes uh, particle relative positions and also uh, lengths, possibly, and widths for that matter. Yeah, I hope this was some kind of answer. Yeah. Or if you wonder more, you can ask more questions via the chat. Yes. Um, so we're, we're waiting a little bit more for more questions. Um, I take the opportunity to recommend if you're interested in about knowing more about synchrotron measurements, there's an excellent video lecture <laughs> by Thomas Rosian available at the Research YouTube. A little bit less formal than this one. <laughs> but you can get some good yeah. uh, information and uh, some tips for, for the measurements. And as why I say thank you very much. So I guess you answered the question. And I also take uh, the opportunity to show um, some of the coming program. Next, there we have to talk about AFM, AFM beyond imaging towards molecular understanding of cellulose interactions. And then we have several uh, interesting talks coming up from researchers from KTH and Shalmesh as you can find on the web site, of course. And uh, the 7th of May, we have a special <laughs> special edition, special conference that will be on the Tree Search and Industrial Postdoc program. So more information will come on that. No more questions have come in via the chat. We wait one more minute and know that. Feel free to contact me also if there is any questions afterwards. And you can find a contact and the email on the KTH website, for instance, or at research website. So no more questions. I thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for an excellent presentation. And thank you very much uh, for you who have been listening. And uh, I hope to see you on the upcoming presentations. Yes, thank you.